At Carisbrook, Dunedin, the Australian High Commissioner, Mr. A.R. Cutler, D.C., meets the Australian rugby team as they step out for the first test against the All Blacks. The big crowd of 30,000 is keyed up to see a great battle, and the New Zealand captain, Allen, kicks off into a stiff breeze. The New Zealand forwards are up fast, they pack round, but the ball goes into touch almost on the halfway line. From the line out, the ball travels to Dunn. He's trying to get round Easts, but Easts got him. They're milling round now. The ball goes back to Buchan. He loses it, and it's kicked into touch. Dunn throws in for New Zealand. It's a high one, and it's long. The forwards pack round, and they get down to it. It's out to Schultz. He's going round the blind side. He brushes off a tackle and passes to Easts. East kicks infield, he races after it, he's beating Dunn, and the bounce is right for East, and he's got no one to beat, he's got no one to beat, it's a lovely try. <laughs> Livermore fails with the kick, and now the All Blacks are on the attack. It's done again, but East's got him, East's giving Dunn no room at all. line up, they go into a ruck, the ball passes along the New Zealand line to Argus, and he barges over in the corner. Scott's kick misses, but a few minutes later, Elliot is over near the posts. Scott makes no mistake this time, and the All Blacks go into the lead, 8-3. From the line up, the Aussies break through. And it's, it's Allen, Allen's racing 50 yards on his own to score under the post. It's Livermore kicking again, and it's over. That brings the half-time score, New Zealand 13, Australia 8. It has been fast and bright football, and with another test match still to be played, the visit of the Aussies makes a grand climax to our first post-war season. Australia kicks off again. It goes to McHugh. He throws a long pass to White. White to Haig. Haig to Allen. Allen to Elvidge, Elvidge to Smith, who kicks through. But Piper's there, he takes it and returns the kick, and it goes in the touch just short of halfway. The ball travels out to Argus, he's brought down, Smith tries to pick it up, but overruns, McBride tries to get it, he misses it, it's anybody's ball, and it's kicked through. Allen tries to find the line, but Piper's there again. No, he's dropped it, and they're on top of him, but he recovers and finds the line. In this half, the All Blacks clap on the face and pile up four more tries. And now they're away again. Finley passes to Argus. He's racing for the corner. He's going over. He's going over. No, the whistle's gone for a set scrum. But this time there's no mistake. From Haig to Finley, he's going through. He's going through to the corner, and it's a try. Scott kicks a beauty, and the first test in the bag for the All Blacks at 31 to 8. At Palmerston North, a compact new laboratory has recently been completed for the Dominion's research workers on plant chemistry. Concerned mainly with the solving of pasture problems for the farming community, the work of the laboratory is typified by this preparation of a sample of grass for analysis. Pastures and their nutritional value for stock are the main concern, but some problems of human food are also dealt with. Thus, some of the Palmerston workers are studying samples of a new high extraction flour sent them by the Wheat Research Institute of Christchurch. This is work which will save food, and at the moment, the problem is to measure the vitamin B content of the new flour, samples of which are here being weighed out. The method of measuring the vitamins is a novel one. After extraction from the flour, they're added to the food solution in which a bacteria is grown. This microorganism is called Lactobacillus arabinosis and cannot grow without the B vitamins. The old method was to feed the substance under test to laboratory rats and see how they grew. But whereas rats take many weeks to grow up, the microorganism will give results after only 48 hours in the incubator. In two-day-old samples, greater cloudiness in the tubes on the right is due to greater bacterial growth on a richer diet. The chemist can measure the growth with great accuracy and so tell the millers the vitamin B value of different millings of the flour. In the plant chemistry laboratory, another use of microorganisms is about to take place. 
The director, Dr. Melville, here trying out a method of filtration, has recently returned from the United States. Over there, his studies included the production of penicillin and allied substances. The discovery of these substances has opened up a whole new world of medical and veterinary research. And it will be in this laboratory of the Government Research Department that New Zealand will take its part in exploring this new world of applied chemistry. Potting rabbits with a 22 rifle is one of New Zealand's most popular sports. This chap, like most New Zealand lads, has been brought up with a 22 and knows how to handle it. It will only fire when he wants it to, or at least that's what he thinks. This is what happened. Being keen on getting a rabbit, he carried his rifle loaded and fully cocked but was very careful to keep his hand away from the trigger. Without applying the safety catch or releasing the spring, he climbs the fence. He handles his rifle carefully and still keeps his hand away from the trigger. But what he doesn't know is that a hard object on the ground will fire his rifle when the butt strikes it. This is what happened that time. These lads struck a poor patch of sport and decided to move on. Instead of unloading his rifle, this lad is uncocking it before he puts it in the car. To make really sure it's safe, he tests the trigger. What he doesn't know is that a blow on the end of the cocking piece can still fire the rifle. Deer stalking is another favorite sport and it's particularly popular with ex-servicemen. They're familiar with 303 rifles. But what they seldom know is that, like the 22, an uncocked but loaded 303 can be fired by a blow on the end of a cocking piece. When sliding downhill, a projecting rock acts like the car fender did on the 22. For shooting among scrub, a shotgun is the most effective weapon. The old hammer type is still widely used, but it's dangerous. Merely lowering the hammers and leaving the cartridge in the gun doesn't make it safe. It can still be fired without the trigger being touched. Watch how this accident happens. These accidents are of great concern to Mr. Kelly, arms expert of the police department. I'm just going to demonstrate those points again using blank. In the first instance, a blow on the butt of the loaded rifle. The rifle is loaded and cocked, and the hands are well away from the trigger. If I bang that butt on the floor, the rifle will fire. In the second case, I load the rifle, and uncock it. It won't fire if I pull the trigger. Even if I hit the end of the cocking piece, there, it will fire. Now the hammer type shotgun. There is a strong spring in the hammer, and if it's drawn back only halfway and released from there, it will fire the gun. That's what happened when the hammer caught in the fence. <clears throat> in the last 10 years, there have been 500 cases of gun accidents recorded by the police department. Some are due to ignorance, many to carelessness. The lesson for everybody is, no matter how familiar you are with guns and rifles, you can never be too careful. Mm -hmm.